Firstly, I'd like to thank Vesna and her team for giving us this opportunity to share our ideas with you, all, with you all here today and to enable this powerful bridge between UK education system and Montenegro and the Balkans in this crucial year of tipping points for our societies and for our humanity, as well as for our biodiversity and ecosystems. Hi, both of you. Great that you could join me on here today. Um, you haven't met each other before, and so maybe for the sake of our audience, you'd like to tell us, as well as each other, you'd like to tell us who you are, say a few words about yourselves, and how your experience has led you to engage in the environmental movement and education, which is the topic of our chat at Green Culture 2020. I'll then ask you both a few questions, which might tease out some of the power of this work and inspire some great questions from our audience today. Um, Julie, would you like to start? And then Stephen, if you'd like to follow. Uh, well, uh, my name is Julie Ward and um, I was a member of the European Parliament from 2014 to January 31st, 2020. And I came into politics um, from the world of arts and culture and education. Um, and during my mandate, I co-founded a children's rights intergroup in the European Parliament because children um, are really not listened to. They're largely ignored uh, because they don't have a vote. And lots of politicians have not yet realized that children are the voters of the future and that we have to engage with children and um, not just listen, but really act on their um, recommendations uh, and involve them in policy making. Uh, and that probably means doing things very, very differently. Um, and because I worked in the arts before I worked in politics and I worked in theater, uh, my work was um, very engaged with interactive learning. Um, you know, people not sitting in rows in chairs, but getting up, going outdoors. Uh, you know, I did loads and loads of theater work uh, in forests and in nature reserves. And um, I've been engaged with young people now at not just national level, but European level and international level. And what I've seen is that the arts are totally unique in giving young people uh, uh, the means of developing confidence and uh, uh, a kind of questioning curiosity that um, is very difficult um, in more kind of traditional education methods. So that's what I'm, you know, that's where I'm at. And I'm still wanting to connect up all those dots, even though I'm not in the European Parliament anymore. <laughs> that's fantastic. You've almost a a asked, answered some of the other questions that I've got for you today. Um, Stephen, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, uh, my name's Stephen Whitehead and I run um, a not-for-profit called Countershade, which is specifically designed to use, um, to use art as a process to develop empathy with nature so that people can develop their own best practice and share with other people a more sustainable lifestyle. Um, there's, there's increasing talk now about culture and people talk about soil culture, finally. Um, and also human culture, that's everything we do. So it seems super relevant to me as an artist that as a cultural agent, I should be sharing practice that will that's helped me with other people. So I try as much as possible just to work in communities um, and to allow people um, a sort of a safe cultural space where they can develop their own ideas about how they want to live their lives and what their relationship is going to be with the rest of nature. Um, and I've been doing this, I suppose, I changed my practice about 20 years ago or so um, because I just felt that art needed to be more relevant. Artists need to be more socially useful. We don't need to instrumentalize what we do but we do need to make sure that we are of use to society. And I think as cultural agents, we have an incredibly important role. Fantastic. Um, so as I hope, I hope everybody got a real feel for, um, for what the great imagining um, is as a, as a, as a, as a project, as a concept, as a program. Um, and obviously there's some 
you can have an opportunity to ask a few questions at, at the end. But um, I mean, I've, I've started to describe the great imagining as a, as a very concentrated way to s approach several different agendas at once. Um, the first being a, a kind of form of citizens assembly in every school shared through a fabulous immersive public exhibition um, to put the schools at the heart of transformation in their communities, a kind of Rob Hopkins transition networks model. I don't know if anyone's aware of Rob Hopkins' work, but um, so happy to send the link at the end. Um, to prevent a practice, to, to bring a practice-based teaching of creativity to UK schools, um, where currently innovation, collaboration, imagination, critical thinking, and creativity are being pretty much squeezed out of the curriculum. I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of how the curriculum works in, in the Balkans, um, so I'm only coming from a UK perspective there. Um, and then finally, to, to give students a chance to explore what they love and, and are really good at in a safe environment where they can experiment and make mistakes. Um, this is very much around the, the, the late Ken Robin, Robinson's um, kind of provocations and, and um, you know, work within, within creativity and education. Um, particularly his talk about being in your element, I think is a really powerful way of thinking about how 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 um, we can inspire young people with a kind of awe and excitement about the future, given the fact that, that everything is so uncertain and and in such um, flux and change. Um, so I've got a couple of questions for for you both, and then and then um, maybe we can open it up to the audience. Um, this is a question for both of you. What do you think the real power for you of, is of this kind of work? Now you've touched on that a little bit in your introductions, but um, I thought I'd get another little kind of go at that as well. Eyes with you. Uh, okay, well, I think we've got to break down lots of um, borders and boundaries um, between uh, not just people, but between subject areas. And um, one of the things that I did in the European Parliament was to um, in uh, introduce the idea of STEAM, not STEM. So, you know, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and maths, and is often given precedence over arts and humanities. But if you put the A in there and call it STEAM, you're actually including arts and humanities, and you've got a much, uh, a much broader, um, more well-rounded um, idea about the different um, subjects that should be uh, studied and for me excluding arts from STEM has always been very strange because scientists and I would include natural scientists in this scientists have to think creatively in order to innovate and invent and artists are working with science so for example dancers are counting so are musicians um, architects are working with with um, uh, space um, uh, and visual artists are often working with chemistry and and physics so um, I I really I think what's really important is to have this more kind of holistic approach to education um, in the first place and that has to uh, I think that teachers and educators not just teachers but that whole school environment has to be on board with um, a much freer way of exploring both the media environment and the sort of macro environment in which we live the earth um, so and, and I can see how this plan would really free up people to explore you know, beyond those narrow boundaries that, that uh, 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 um, I believe are, are imposed upon um, students and the academic community. Uh, and they don't help because then people are very, very stuck within their different, um, uh, they're, they're stuck within their spaces and within their academic subjects. And, uh, and 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 everything becomes very competitive and actually what we've got to do is stop being competitive and finding ways to work together so this for me would be like the main uh the main benefit of, of what you're proposing is that it, it it would just free up all that all that time all that space and i i mean time in one's head as much as time in the classroom and the school mm. excellent yeah I, I, I'm, so I'm, I'm enrolled. Um, I think that the, the, the thing with the um, culture being kind of everything about how we live, um, not just 
the arts is such a, an important distinction, um, as well as kind of how we reflect the diversity of our various kinds of intelligences and, and abilities and racial backgrounds and all of the different kinds of ways that, 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 that a classroom is made up of the, all this talent that's most of which is for me underused. Um, Stephen. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with everything that's been said. There's not a huge surprise there. I think- You've got a part... provo provo provocation person on his <laughs> No, it's, it, I think this is, this is part of the great revolution that's happening within our minds is reality has always been there for us to discover, but we've stopped ourselves. Finally, we're understanding the interconnectedness of everything. And when you realize that, when you realize there is a wood wide web, when you realize that you need to feed your internal biome as well as just throw calories into your body for you, then you start to understand everything differently. You, and you, you, this, it goes back again to this word culture, culture, culture all the time is we are cultural agents, but that's not just because we're in theatre or the arts. It's because we're actively involved. And a lot of what we do doesn't just grow us. It's not a benefit to us directly as an individual. We're growing a culture that we live in. And I think it's that collaboration and it's understanding how that collaboration will be of benefit to you and to everyone else is a really revolutionary thought. Um, and it takes a lot of time for it to sort of soak up, but people need to experience it and they need to live it. They need to do it. And we're the people to help them do that. We're not telling them how to live. We're not telling them what to do, but we can create creative frameworks in which people can play and they'll understand this in their own way and they'll find their way of fitting into this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've, 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 I've got a couple of uh, um, more political questions um, here. Like, so for both of you, because um, I know Stephen, that you've also had a lot of kind of uh, involvement in, in, in Europe and the cultural um, mm -hmm. activities of Europe. How do you see the role of education in building bridges in our struggling economies, um, pandemic related um, and national relationships now that UK is leaving Europe? Well, well. <laughs> on, you, you've got to take this one first, please. We're in a, we're in a very difficult situation because um, our young people um, who are the citizens of the future, the voters of the future, the leaders of the future, the business leaders of the future. Um, our young people um, have been very much disenfranchised, actually. And um, they were born into um, a Europe uh, and not necessarily um, in understanding, you know, the complex, rather techn uh, technocratic um, aspects of being in the EU but certainly feeling European. And um, I think that um, what the government is doing um, is, a, is, you know, is, a, is a nod to the past and it isn't engaging with the future. Uh, and so um, culture and cultural links, intercultural dialogue, in, which in fact was my biggest a piece of work in the European Parliament was a report on intercultural dialogue for diversity, education and fundamental values. Um, this is going to be absolutely crucial to how uh, the next generation rebuild and strengthen links with neighbours because we cannot um, be adrift as an island in the world right now when so much requires us to collaborate and solve problems collectively. And I think our young people know that. Uh, they know that what's happened is extremely unfair, that they weren't given a say, um, that adults are, in a way have stolen their future. And I don't think they will uh, be quiet about it in the future. And um, so that continuing dialogue is going to be even more important than it was before. And that dialogue um, has 
also uh, really flowered online, um, you know, because we've been stuck um, not being able to travel during the pandemic, but it hasn't stopped people from finding um, others like themselves. And when you come into those spaces and you start engaging with people around um, music or food or fashion, um, you know, the environment, you know, uh, then you suddenly realize that people um, from a different country, maybe from a different faith, speaking um, in a different language, actually care about the same things that you care about. Um, and that um, you can make a difference when you come together. Uh, and, and really the F Fridays for Future movement, which I became involved in initially in Brussels, I mean, not because I'm a young person, but because I'm, I was a policy maker and I was on the committee that was concerned with youth policy. And also because I was supporting lots and lots of youth groups and ac young activists and young citizens, um, that movement um, just completely uh, took over the world to the extent where young people who'd been told to be quiet, sit down, shut up, listen, uh, uh, and you know, grown ups know best, suddenly went, actually, no, we're a movement, we are the future, it's our environment and uh, our sustainability that's at risk. You know, our, this is an existential uh, crisis that's happening. Those young people have have scared, if you like, the 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 powerful. They've really scared the people in power who want to hold on, and um, it's been a movement that's been full of creativity. So linking, you know, activism to creativity to the environment has been where where this where this has. Um, has found its strength, I think, where the movement's found its strength. Um, and that's because um, we, uh, we are born to be curious, playful, creative, experimental. And as we grow older, um, it's sort of knocked out of us quite a lot. And we're told, you know, that's just something for kids. And that's not how we do put things in the grown up world. But actually, if you continue to nurture your creativity and you're not afraid to engage in those intercultural, um, you can have, you can hold on to hope. And I think that probably is the most important message here is that we do not have to take this and that young people will not take it. They are going to be the change makers and they've reached out across those boundaries and borders and they've built a movement like no other. And um, I'm, I'm really heartened by that. And I think that, you know, it couldn't have happened without that intercultural dialogue that young people do um, naturally, even if they can't speak each other's language, they're still dancing that dance and singing those songs and, you know, making, making friendship bracelets, whatever it is, they're still doing it. Fantastic. Yeah, so inspiring. Yeah. It's a very beautiful thing to see. I mean, we had a, um, a wonderful example when uh, we did the Green Culture Exchange last year and we had the, uh, the group of young people come over from Montenegro um, and visit a, a secondary school in London. Um, it didn't take introductions. It didn't take having to set something really fancy up. You just empty a classroom, throw a pile of English kids in and a pile of Montenegrin kids in, and they immediately are, are talking to one another and they're finding cultural links. They're finding much more in common than they're finding different to one another. The difference is lovely. The difference is why you travel. Um, but also there's something really special about people seeing the link immediately, just finding things in common and sharing them together. And I think also because we then, because the thing was whole, the, the entire um, meeting was framed around sharing ideas around what could happen in the future around sustainability and their relationship to nature again they were able to build something together and politicians can do whatever they want to do and they will limit us to some extent but their 
it's very, very difficult to stop things like that automatically happening. So I think the good will, the good will automatically come out as long as we get the opportunity to just put people together. It really doesn't take much more than that. And that's, that's really exciting to see. Um, and you and you get to see things that you never expected as well. I mean, some of the conversations, you know, seemed quite strange initially, you know, because that wasn't the first thing that would have come to, to my mind. But that's the beauty of working in groups is that all kinds of stuff comes out. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. I think I think, um, you know, that there is so much healing to do in the world right now in, uh, you know, as much as building. So I think that the the. the those kind of conversations between between young people who are, are still in their curious space and still wanting to kind of find out is is invaluable um, at this at this at this particular time. Um, Julie, I've got a bit of a question for you. Um, what value did you? And I think maybe you might have answered this, so so we could we could, but maybe there's something else to say. What value did your experience as an artist and cultural producer bring to your work as an MEP? Um. I, I'm a communicator and I communicate on a very human level and um, I learned the importance of stories, um, both real stories, testimony, but also um, stories of metaphor and symbol. And um, so whenever I was speaking in the debates, in the committees and in the plenary, I was always very concrete about what I said. I always referred to real people, real places, real projects. Um, and I felt that that communicated something that uh, was um, of much more um, immediate impact than talking about um, te uh, technical uh, legislative issues. I mean, um, you know, I had to engage with all that stuff. And, and in fact, I've been a journalist and a writer and an editor as well. So um, I'm very, uh, I'm very assiduous about language. But I think in terms of communication, um, we've got to appeal to that very kind of the, this sort of human life cycle, you know, what, what it means to be young, to be a child, to, you know, be an adolescent, to, uh, be somebody who's leaving school, to be a, um, somebody looking for work, to be uh, a young parent, you know, to then be somebody, um, you know, who's facing uncertainty in work, to, to be somebody on the verge of retiring, to be a grandparent. It's those, those things. And, and they've, they've, they've been the things that we've always cared about in terms of stories and that goes right across all cultures you know I think there's um, only seven stories in the world and those seven stories are told again and again and again um, by different cultures and they've been used by famous filmmakers and they work and there's a reason why they work they work because they appeal to the human heart and the human soul and I, as, as somebody who, I mean, worked in theatre, but was, I was also a storyteller. So, you know, and I've uh, been researching stories and I think I, I'm in love with that myself. So I could still be in love with my role as a politician, provided it gave me a platform to communicate on that human level. And I, I'm kind of sad in a way that not more artists took the plunge and did what I did and I would really like to see a wider range of people um, engaging at political level and uh, using the confidence that they can get from working in the arts and that different way of doing things to give them the platform um, to you know make that make that step um, I, and it is, I mean, I, th I hope that what I did was to emanate a warmth, a compassion and empathy. Uh, and again, that's something definitely that I learned through my theatre practice. You, you can't stand on stage and inhabit a character 
if you don't have empathy for that character. So I think, um, yeah, there's a real place for artists to step into that space. And I think politics would be a much better place if we had more people with those kinds of uh, qualities because you can learn the rest. You don't have to go to university to do a degree about politics to do what I did. You really don't. You need, you need fantastic staff, you know, which I had, and they taught me all the technical stuff, but you've got to be able to stand up there and, and be a communicator, yeah. And, and to do it in a, a way where people trust you. I've never heard such a such a call to arms for people to become politicians before. Mm. That's, a, that's a, so inspiring. Um, thank you. Um, I've got another question for you. Um, in your experience as a member of several coalitions, um, which I know you're on now, because so am I. Um, in your contribution to and in your in, con in your contribution to confer international conferences such as this, where do you think? Where do you see the world right now and what are your hopes for the future? That's a really long answer, but maybe I can give you, you, you can give me a, just a very quick summary. Uh, well, I, I think the thing is to keep taking the space, isn't it? You know, uh, as a teenager, I was a failure. I failed everything, okay? I, I failed my 11 plus, then I failed my A-levels, you know? I, I didn't get into university. I went out to work in a factory, but that didn't mean that I didn't have something to offer. And um, I was quite angry about the way that I was labeled a failure. And I learned to take, take the space. I, le I learned to push open the doors and to put my foot in the door and, you know, to say, I have a right to be here and I have something to say. And I think that I always took with me a great sense of, um, uh, anger about uh, unfairness and about inequality uh, and wanting uh, when I so when I became successful I was like well who else should be here on this in this space with me um, so the, the most important thing is you know is doing that is taking that space yeah um, and so if the right if the if the kind of conferences that we feel are important and not happening, then we need to make those conferences, we need to create those spaces. And I believe very much that um, what Culture Declares an Emergency has done is to recognize um, uh, that culture has an absolute fundamental role to play in um, uh, pushing arts organizations into taking a lead in something. So that's one of the coalitions that we're involved in. And that would seem really obvious, wouldn't it? But you know, it, it wasn't happening. It wasn't happening because in a way, uh, lots of arts organizations had been uh, pushed into being competitive, you know, with each other rather than being collaborative. So uh, those of us who know about the importance of collaboration and know about the importance of breaking down boundaries and of opening up spaces and being inclusive, I think we have to keep saying, um, let's make those spaces and give those spaces to the people whose voices haven't been heard, you know, and keep asking, who's not in the room, you know? Uh, 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 who, who, is it the usual suspects again, you know? <laughs> let's, let's, let's keep saying, you know, there's some great people I know from this community, that community, you know, they should be on the platform speaking uh, and give up our spaces. Fantastic. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, Stephen, in your experience working with students in UK schools and then in your exchange program with Green Culture Diplomats, I mean, you kind of answered this one as well. Um, how do you see the state of play in education in the UK and beyond? Um, Education in the UK for me has become increasingly frustrating because um, when I first changed my practice and started uh, doing relational work, um, work with, with communities or with, with school groups, um, we were supported by the Arts Council um, and there was a completely different feel to the way in which artists could actually be useful and they could 
they could teach across the curriculum um, and they could encourage creativity. And then we had the crash, we had a change of government and um, basically the gainsaying of a lot of work which had been based on you know scientific results this this shouldn't have been ideological um you know creativity is is the thing that we need to encourage in schools not the learning of stuff which by the time you leave school will be out of date and therefore you'll never get the job that you want because it's been uninvented now and there's a whole new range of jobs so you know even on a on a really sort of um very pragmatic level if you consider education is just about getting a job, which I don't think it is, but a lot of people, that's the argument that's put forward, then it still, it still just doesn't work. So um, I don't know how, ho how hopeful I am because it's, been, it's getting harder and harder to actually go into schools and actually be able to contribute anything because they don't have the money, they don't have the time, and they very often don't have the inclination because they're being, um, that so many other demands are being put on school that um, they're disincentivized from being creative and risk taking. Um, there are ways of getting in. I mean, the, the reason that I stopped being an individual artist and I set myself up as a community interest company is so that I can access funding, which I can then use to deliver work in schools for free. Now that's one huge hurdle to get over because obviously schools are struggling financially. And we should never forget the money aspect of anything that we do here because it's all about the money. You know, somebody's got to be paid to do their job. Where's the money going to come from? So I've tried to find uh, the money to make that possible. But even with that, there are clearly other things which are blocking the possibility of doing any creative work whatsoever in schools um, for a lot of schools um, and I don't know what the solution to that is I mean I'm, I'm hoping that with the great imagining that it's it's so exciting and it's so big that it just bulldozes a lot of the silly opposition out of the way and we just say look just do it do it for two weeks and then we'll, we'll show you what you actually get out of it because we don't have um, a fixed ideology we don't have an agenda over and above helping people so for goodness sakes you know how dangerous can that be mm. you're yeah. going you make the decisions along along the way as you do this thing we're not imposing a fixed idea on you mm. so we've got to find a way of getting that into schools um, i think it's like everything in life you leading by example and i'm quoting here i'm paraphrasing uh, einstein so i can't claim this um but it's it's a it's a lovely quote um leading by example is not just a good way of getting people to change it's the only way and i think what we have to do is lead by example and be the very best we can and be open and show that. But also we need to get into at least some pilot schools and show what an amazing effect this can have. And then I think the rest will follow. So that, that to me is the solution. It's, it's not even so much about winning the argument. I think we've, we've forgotten the practice of doing rather than just talking about stuff. And even if we don't get it absolutely right, we learn so much by doing and we need to get into a school or schools and we need to actually do the work. And then I think, you know, the, the results will speak for themselves. So Gavin Williamson, Minister of Education, if you're out there, this is a great... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and, and just to give a bit more of our sort of, uh, the, of, the, of the lovely flavour of, and, and the de deliciousness of this, of this practice, um, Stephen, can you describe some of your work? And, give us some examples of powerful transformations that you've witnessed in young people as a result of this kind of work. Um, yeah, that's a difficult one. A, a, a lot of it is, um, is so subtle and so long term that you can't just say, we went in one day, wham, bam, everything changed. A lot of subtle things change and a lot of things change that you didn't expect to change. Or sometimes you're asked to do a job and you know that you need to get different outcomes. I mean, I, I remember years and years ago, I was asked to go into um, a community group and work with the youth there who were really mixed um, ages. Um, and 
they said, oh, we want you to paint a mural. So, okay, I'm a visual artist. You want a mural, we'll paint a mural. And I'll work with all of the young people and we'll create a mural. But I said, what are the real issues that you need to deal with? And also just talking to the young people, what became the issues for them? And the fact that, that, that one of the uh, young people had been uh, murdered um, while we were doing the project um, and it threw up discussions about the violence that they just lived with all the time it was a real threat of um, of knife crime, but also just every young person feeling obligated to carry a knife because they felt that was going to keep them safe. So one of the things that I did was um, it, it helped in visual art terms that we we just needed for people to put their portraits on the wall and not everyone felt as comfortable doing that because they said, oh, I'm no good at art. So I would work through individually with them on that. But also uh, we found a system where we photographed them and they could make a stencil and to make the stencil, they had to use scalpels. So I had a room full of young people with surgical scalpels all experimenting with the knife on paper and realizing how incredibly sharp and dangerous potentially this tiny tool was because they knew it was designed to open up bodies. Um, and we didn't then need to have a just say no kids conversation about knives. They understood what a blade did. So that, that, was a, that was a, you know, an outcome which nobody expected apart from, from me as the artist. It's not something that was asked for, but I think it's those kind of, of changes that we get. There's so much that's indirect. So I could answer your question by just saying, oh yeah, I, we did this on the environment and that's the result we got. But actually I think it runs a lot slower and a lot deeper than that. And you just sometimes just don't know. You'd need to go back a year later mm -hmm. and, and maybe do some research on that. But certainly there are, there are effects. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been working um, with young people like for decades and I'm still in touch with uh, young people that I worked with when they were, you know, um, in uh, infant school and primary school. And I was at a meeting recently of um, uh, counsellors and um, one of them sent me a message on the Zoom chat and it said, I'm reading it now. I can absolutely endorse the validity and power of theatre in schools. It must be not far off 30 years ago when you did a piece of work over a term at the school I worked in then, near Thursk. The work you did really helped focus and also turn around a lot of the lads there. One in particular I found a letter from just the other day. He was at Leeds University doing a chemistry degree. I honestly think that the work your team was involved with the boys was significant. All right, and if you, if you spend time with people who's, who've worked in, uh, in participatory arts, in education or in youth, you know, in the uh, criminal justice system, and you've made relationships in your own communities with those young people, um, they think of the arts organization almost as family and they keep coming back and they, and they give the evidence about the transformations and they are profound, they are lifelong. And just to put it in the context of um, uh, exchanges and mobility between young people from different countries, uh, I was my organization. So I used to run a, an artist's co-op and we regularly took young people from marginalized communities, uh, from the coalfield communities of Durham, which is where I am now, uh, to meet with their peers from all around Europe uh, in a wonderful um, uh, environment in the Harz Mountains in Germany, using arts and culture for two weeks to explore what it, uh, sort of common identity issues around being European, uh, issues um, about the environment, um, about peace, all those kinds of things. And those young people were not um, privileged young people. They were the young people who were having problems, who were excluded, you know, who were getting into trouble for various reasons, you know, who probably weren't, weren't going to go to university. 
And I saw the transformation of those young people when they returned from that two week engagement, they, um, they stopped, uh, they, they stopped missing school. Uh, they started volunteering in their communities. They joined local uh, youth councils. They uh, became, some of them actually went to um, university, some went to college, some became leaders in the very organization that had supported them uh, and which they'd engaged with. And I still know them. And they, their, the point of the transformation was, um, yes, they were engaging back in their own communities with the arts but the really transformative experiences came with those intercultural dialogue experiences um, when they realized that other young people from around the world were actually just like them in many ways young people who shared the same worries the same concerns had the same aspirations and hopes exactly yeah that, that, that's that's so true and and Stephen's temporarily disappeared, but... but um, if I, I just say something else about that, because this is important in terms of um, arguments for the arts, yeah. that those young people would be the young people who would be costing the government money because they would be getting into trouble, they would not be at work, they would be uh, you know, causing antisocial behaviour, they would end up in the criminal justice system, whatever. But by giving those young people a really profound self uh, sense of their own self-worth and by giving them confidence, by uh, connecting them with, those, uh, with that wider community, they then become active, uh, active agents of change um, and to the extent where they become business people, where they become civic leaders, where they become active volunteers. And this is an important economic argument that government after government have failed to understand. And it is the arts that have made that change. It is intercultural dialogue that has made that change. And it is the ability to meet each other across borders that has made that change. And if we cut those things out of our future education um, programs, what we're actually doing is piling up all kinds of problems that will cost money in the future you know so we have to uh, i could make that economic argument every day of the week put money <laughs> into giving young people agency into teaching them um you know common humanity and doing that through fun activities that are about you know being in spaces where people uh, can feel uh, connected yeah and you know, we would have a lot more money to spend on social care, hospitals, you know, bus services, trains, uh, all the rest of it. If we just sorted out some basic, um, uh, some basic things about relationships. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Um, shall I just try and get Stephen back on? Like we can, mm. we can cut, cut this little snip out. But, um, it's, it's such a brilliant conversation, Julie. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, um, I'm going to well, give that might, be a, that might be a bit too did you, back. Did you manage to get back on the yeah, link? Yeah, I don't know what's happened. I just sort of, the whole, my whole computer just crashed. Um, I've switched it back on. I'm trying to get back in now. Okay. We'll just, we'll, um, um, I might just ask Julie another question while you're, while you're out. The, the, the conversation's probably too long, but I'm going to, I'm going to give uh, Dion the amazing task of cutting it down to the, to the right length. So, um, yeah. yeah. He'll just have to kind of uh, well the things I just said might be might be far too specific for um, uh, the audience at the at the conference but yeah I mean it's it's really fascinating and I think there's there's so much uh, value in the conversation um, in different ways so hopefully we'll be able to um, use bits uh, in that uh, economic arguments important Deborah I mean it's huge it's huge it's and why aren't people People that's, get why, it. that's why you know there, there will be a moment where we've got enough different parties on board where we will go to the government and we will say look this is a kind of no-brainer it's like a really really affordable way of kind of ticking loads of boxes and you know it'll be really slightly gut-wrenching for us to yeah. sort of like kind of like kind of have to sort of like kind of give them the credit and pressure but um, at the same time uh, you know however we can do it really um, so Stephen, are you having any luck getting back on? 
Um, I'm not yet, no. I'm still working on it. Okay, well, if you, if you do, as long as you're quiet, I'll ask um, uh, Julie another question and, you, and I'll leave you um, yeah. uh, tuned into this. And if, yeah, when, when, I see, when I see you um, coming back into my Zoom, I'll, I'll let you in. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, um, all right, great. So, for Dion's sake, this is another question now. Um, so, this is a question for both of you, but maybe Julie, you could go first. Um, the UK and, and the Balkans are both experiencing the entrenched political and tribal divisions that seem to be um, such a moment in history in many European countries, let alone in America. Um, can you give us your opinion and perhaps some anecdotal evidence of how you feel divided communities can be brought together and he healed in this agonizing time of division? Some of that we've um, <laughs> Well, um, sharing culture, uh, is, is important. Um, so um, eating, you know, sharing each other's food, coming together in, in safe spaces um, uh, to address common problems is, is really good. Um, I, you know, gardening, I, I, I can remember um, visiting a really wonderful kind of garden in um, uh, an urban uh, social housing complex in Hanover in Germany and um, there were a lot of it's, this is quite a long time ago and there were sort of refugee and migrant communities there and um, they were they were sort of trying to grow the vegetables that they really enjoyed um, uh, using in their different uh, uh, cooking uh, and they were being helped by the more kind of traditional you know uh, long-term residents from this uh, from this complex and those kind of hands-on activities where uh, people are showing each other things you know sort of rolling up their sleeves doing stuff I, I, I really think that is the that is the one of the key um, criteria for success you know being in the same space or, or sharing you know being in the same space working together on something or in spaces sharing things together and food has such a profound impact on people you know um you know cooking for each other um and eating in that same space um uh, and i i was i've been so privileged you know to uh in my constituency which had you know was very very multicultural to be invited to so many different festivals, uh, different um, different cultural festivals, different religious festivals, different kind of key moments for those communities, and it was a real pleasure to participate. You know, to sit on the floor and uh, to uh, to break the fast, for example. Um, you know, during um, uh, during Eid, so. I, I would say that has to be paramount, finding, finding moments for doing that together. Now that's quite difficult at the minute because we're not allowed to, you know, even, I mean, we're not even allowed to visit each other's families right now. So we've got to find uh, other ways to do that. But um, I, um, I think that, um, D divide hate and division comes through um fear and often comes from uh uh mainstream media you know mainstream media and also online media where people are not necessarily challenged to investigate the uh the information that they're receiving um so perhaps a a really important thing that educators need to do um, is to teach um, inquiry, questioning. You know, where where are your facts coming? You know, uh, what does that headline mean? You know, uh, is the picture that you're looking at? You know, uh, is that picture designed to um, provoke a certain uh, a certain response? Particularly if it's Put with a particular uh, text or caption or headline, 
So I think that um, media literacy is absolutely crucial to the work that needs to happen. Um, uh, you know, we need to feel we need to feel safe in our spaces too. So we've got to do a lot of work around uh, people being safe online um, and feeling supported when they're uh, it, 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 in environments where they where they might be. Uh, subject to you know derision or to um, hate speech or to being put down even um, and, and in that respect I'd just like to talk about sex and relationship education if I can because uh, there's a lot of people who are like oh we don't want sex and relationship education you know that will just result in more kind of teenage pregnancies and I'm like no you know what it will result in is um is in really respectful relationships between boys and girls and people and non-binary people and let's do that let's have respectful relationships and you know so I, i'm I, i'm really concerned about the, the the fear that a lot of people have about talking about taboo subjects because we need more openness we need to be um, creating more spaces where we can have those difficult conversations. So in fact, the idea of citizens assemblies is perfect because that's about bringing people together with all their different views, um, with all their different learned behaviors, putting people into a space together where they agree to um, give the time and the space and the energy to listening and respectful listening has to be part of the way forward. Amazing, very powerful. I know it's kind of a um, yeah, um, all of that. Stephen, have you got anything you'd like to to um, add to to what Julie's just said? Well, just responding to that. Um, yes, I mean, it, going back to what you were saying about metaphor and symbol, I think there's a lot of science that we can now use and just say, well, look, this is the way things work. This isn't ideological. It's just these, these are the way dynamic systems work and we're part of a system, get used to it. And diversity and interconnectedness is just the way of the world. But we know that human beings work on feelings rather than being entirely rational. And they love stories more than they necessarily like a pile of facts. And I think that's where we come in is that, yes, you have mechanisms like the assemblies, but I think you need to have people in the arts involved in it so that we help create the frameworks in which these things operate. Because one of the, um, one of the things I always talk about with my work is that when people say, oh, Stephen, so what do you do as an artist? What do you paint or what do you make? Well, yes, I, yes, I am a sculptor. Yes, I do paint, but actually I'm a relational artist. So what I'm doing is I'm making conceptual frameworks for you to play in. But the framework has a huge amount of space inside and that's space for you to feel safe because it's being defined. And by being a defined space, you know that when you enter it, you can then experiment. You can meet people you'd never met before. You can be open because you don't have to go in there with agendas because you're not there to win an argument. You're there to investigate things. And I think that's the huge difference. And I, that's why I think the assembly is a brilliant idea, but it needs to be done by the right people because just saying assembly doesn't work. And just, say, just in the same way as saying, oh, democracy, it's a great idea, yeah, but it's how you do it because you can use democracy as a weapon against people. Yeah. Um, I mean, I also, I also think that it's, it's, a, a, it's trusting the, 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 the young people or in the case of an adult assembly, to the, the, um, the people in that, in that so you're holding a space for people with mm -hmm. it to explore and, and ask questions and, and I think the recent um, climate assembly in the UK, which was commissioned by the government in response yes. to the Extinction Rebellion um, protest, um, and that you know that there there the, there was um, a very uh, um, I don't know what metrics they used to kind of ensure that that, that there was a representative group of people there. But you know, I think there was fifteen percent of the people were people who were quite sceptical about 
climate change and and um, environmental um, factors and that and just being able to give people the space to be able to discuss within themselves but between themselves is really powerful and I think that that what's what I what I what I love about the idea of bringing artists in the building of the of the great imagining um, creatives are much wider than just artists um, you know creative educators creative thinkers um, is that 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 with children young people you know if you make it playful and you make it fun and you make it exciting they're more they're more engaged and they're more they're more curious and they're more um, up for stuff and and I think that that that, that sort of um, you know the, the thing with the traditional education is that it does it does to some extent start to kind of put you in these boxes of people who are going to be successful at their education in inverted commas and people who are not going to be successful at their education people who find it engaging and people who find it boring and people who um feel that they're very good at these specific subjects and people who feel they're very good at these specific subjects and and to kind of open that up and and to to enable um the the whole school to feel um reinvigorated and re and re um, re animated in the learning is uh, is what i'm committed to <laughs> um I, I think there's another thing that we forget as well because it's so normal for us that we we just forget to mention it but we create spaces that allow that give people permission they give people permission to 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 think to question to fail and it be okay um and i suppose again going back to so where do you think the big influence is in your work question um that's probably one of the real biggies and it's so big that i just forgot to mention it but it's seeing that light go on in somebody's eyes when you just say yeah so what do you think or of course you can do that if you want to do that you know you, it's for you it's for you to be in control of what you're doing now you know i've set up that framework now you're playing inside it and that excitement and somebody just comes alive um and it's always been there you know we're, we're not we're not geniuses we're just open and but that's a really big thing and staying open is really difficult particularly in in environments where it's not encouraged um, but we've got to keep on doing it because we've got to keep on providing that for people. Mm. Yeah, the great, sorry, if I just, uh, you know, I'm a theatre practitioner and there are a number of very inspiring theatre practitioners whose work we should be using. One of them, Dorothy Heathcote, um, I was privileged enough to actually attend one of her workshops and I remember her saying um, uh, what we should be doing is enabling the children to teach us what they know. And, you know, that's an incredibly revolutionary idea, isn't it? You know, I mean, Dorothy Heathcote has been dead, you know, a, a long time. And this is uh, this remark, this belief and all her work was about uh, creating, again, creating those spaces where uh, teachers uh, and educators could learn what the children already knew, you know, and then the children can become active in their in their own learning. The other practitioner we should mention is Augusto Boal, who um, uh, uh, created um, uh, wonderful ways of rehearsing for change. Um, so um, his uh, theater of the oppressed technician uh, uh, techniques uh, created um, spaces for people, I mean, all the work that he did was about um, assessing what the problems were and then trying to find solutions to problems. Uh, and interestingly enough, he became a legislator um, at, at um, state level in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, and used his um, theatre of the oppressed techniques uh, to create legislative theatre. And I think that any techniques, uh, and it was about space. It, it's, it's exactly what you're saying, Stephen. It was about creating those frameworks and space in which people could rehearse for change, try different things out. Would it work? Wouldn't it work? You know, but yeah. And particularly around resolving conflict, which was a, one of your questions, Deborah, about, you know, in this very 
very kind of conflictive environment that we're now in where um, yeah. there's so much division and, and, and so much healing that has to happen. We, we've got to find, uh, we've got to find ways of, of practicing and rehearsing for that change. So that's fantastic. Um, I'm sure that we've probably left very little time for questions right now, but um, I wonder if uh, we could then sort of hand over and see if there's any questions from the audience. Um, so it would be great if, uh, if we could see if there's anything in the chat. Thank you so much, both of you.